Good evening. It's a great pleasure to have uh, Peter Djurjev and Stefan Aron here uh, in Novi Sad. But I would like to start and ask you, you know, how come that far away from Novi Sad in the United States of America, in the city of New Haven, there is this archive where people are keeping a record of a historical event that took place in our city. Well, yes, I mean, it is the, re it is the result of the historical reality of, of post-war emigration that uh, thousands of survivors made their way to the United States and settled. And in New Haven, Connecticut, of all places, uh, a very active small group of survivors uh, and uh, children of survivors, members of the Jewish community and other supporters came together to form a grassroots documentation effort in um, 1979 uh, to record the stories of survivors in the New Haven area. And um, because this was an organization driven uh, by survivors themselves, they took a very different approach to uh, to this type of documentation work. Uh, but, uh, so it is a, a project that began in New Haven but then spread outside of uh, New Haven and was reproduced in a number of cities across the United States and also in Europe through affiliate projects. So not only do we have testimonies of survivors who came to the United States from this region and discuss in particular Novi Sad and even the events that we are here to commemorate. Uh, but we also have testimonies of survivors from, uh, from uh, Belgrade and the region around that were taken here in Serbia, in, uh, in Serbo-Croatian. So we have a, a, a quite a, a two sides, both the, of the Atlantic, we have uh, an effort to document, um, document these events. So um, it is simply the natural, uh, the natural historical development of, um, of these uh, survivors starting new lives in the United States, but then um, returning to, to this period in order to give testimony to our collection. I think that um, uh, talking about shared memory and shared heritage, shared cultural heritage, and uh, something that hopefully we learned um, after the history, the, after the Holocaust. Um, people here, I don't think that they are so much aware that uh, in many places around the world, basically, uh, there are and there were uh, survivors that kept this memory and, and uh, uh, cherished it and uh, uh, forwarded it further through different projects, institutions, museums, etc. I think that um, understanding and sharing uh, uh, this would have contributed to better understanding of peoples uh, in general. I mean, uh, I'm quite touched personally to think of that somewhere very far away, there are people that are actually taking care that something that happened here is never forgotten. Um, but tell me now, you said that it was driven by survivors mm -hmm. and one could maybe understand their realities and their um, internal needs to, to tell the story. But how is it today? I mean, one of the challenges we face today is to keep the relevance of this story to new generations. Do you think that new generations are interested or should we do something special to make them interested? Well, I guess it depends on which generation and, and what place, right? So the United States, the fact that this, our organization began in New Haven uh, is um, directly uh, the result of this local active survivor community. And at that time, in the 1970s, late 1970s, 79, 80, there was a definite sense of urgency uh, on the part of this project to record the stories of survivors, um, not only because survivors were 
dying and, um, and the stories were being lost as the survivors um, grew old and passed away, but that there was a need to raise awareness of these events um, to a general, more general public, a general um, uh, populace, right? I mean, we're still sort of seeing the developments of what would become in the United States, these are very early days in the 70s, of what would become something along the lines of a national um, m memory, um, national memory, uh, a sort of um, established memory politics, or um, there is no U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum in the United States in the 1970s. And so these are, you have to see that understand that this is a part of a, of, a, of a larger effort to raise a sort of awareness of these events um, that were still sort of clouded in a, in a kind of haze. And so I think that um, what we're facing today is not so dissimilar. I think it's quite, um, quite similar in the sense that um, it seems to me that every generation uh, has to reestablish um, the historical this, the historical period, the, the events, um, and to retell, uh, retell this story through new sources and new research and new approaches, and that this doesn't end. It's not a sort of, we are, we've done this. In, by the 1990s, we've established a sort of, uh, there's a museum in, in Washington, D.C. We have uh, a, a kind of uh, a regime of, of um, pedagogical Holocaust teaching in schools across the country. But this is not something that you do just once. It has to be reformed and readjusted and, 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 and re-argued um, in each generation. And I think that is a... Um, different in the United States. Uh, that yeah, you have to do everywhere, but um, it's different how one makes that argument in the United States versus how one would make that argument, let's say, here in Serbia. Um, I do think there is something uh, quite powerful about the ability for us to, to uh, engage with this history, to explore um, this difficult topic in the, on the sites where these events occurred, and that it has a more organic, you then find a more organic connection between, um, between this, the, the past and the present than you do, let's say, um, in a place like New Haven, Connecticut, so far removed geographically. But um, I do think that the dynamics are somewhat similar in that um, on both sides of, of the Atlantic, one has to reestablish the facts reestablish the story, um, and um, and 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 retell it with new sources and, and, and new uh, through new um, historical research that's being done all the time. I mean, honestly, we're still um, just scratching the surface of this topic, um, despite uh, the enormous amount of research that's been done. So um, we have to to learn that this is a an ongoing, never-ending process. I think that uh, I, I absolutely agree with you. I found it very interesting that you mentioned uh, um, the establishment of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum as, as a pivotal event in, in that sense. Um, here in Serbia, we are working on it. Uh, uh, we are on our way to uh, create, uh, um, let's say, a central Holocaust Museum. We don't have it yet. Um, and this is a good spot to turn to you, uh, Peter, and ask you similar questions. Namely, do you think, do you feel in your work that people here in Serbia are more or less interested in these topics like, you know, victimhood in Se Second World War and general history of Second World War? and that they are informed about this particular history we call the Holocaust, um, and how about the young people? It is very hard to say, but at the start of this uh, interview I have a good news to announce that uh, last day on commemoration of Novi Sad, Ray, Major of Novi Sad told us that Novi Sad is going to make a new uh, memorial center for the victims of Novi Sad raid. That is one more element, as you said, in this 
uh, making up of uh, cultural remembrance. Uh, when we are talking about the Second World War, we have to know that uh, knowing of Second World War in Yugoslav area was, uh, era was very important in our educational system because the Communist Party uh, takes some of the authority of the government for itself uh, in their role they had in the Second World War. So Second World War was very important in our educational system, but uh, during the 90s we have collapse of uh, old Yugoslav regime, we have couple of uh, civil wars and now I say that uh, most of the topics of the Second World War were cast away on the side and, and been forgotten. Uh, we must say that in the last 10 years we have a great breakthrough on the culture of remembrance, of especially about the Holocaust. Uh, our cooperation with terraforming is absolutely crucial uh, in making up new ideas, how we can uh, talk to the young people, trying to find new pedagogical ways and to make new uh, approach to, to, to the younger ones. And first that we saw, we have seen that project that uh, Terraforming had with the historical archives of Bel Belgrade. And I might say that one of the results of that is a law about uh, s uh, concentration camp uh, Saimiste. Uh, in the, the, that's a very good thing that uh, that happened for us. And, and uh, after that, uh, we, we have seen the methods and the ways that uh, historical archives Belgrade tried to talk to the younger people and that is the reason what we are trying to uh, re-establish our primary historical resources as a base uh, on which we can co communicate with the, young, uh, with the younger generations. Uh, we have tried to engage in every kind of uh, social media network to talk to the people, to try to tell them, that, hey, this is important. Uh, we have made uh, numerous uh, historical archives uh, exhibitions. Uh, in in these exhibitions, we are trying to put on the uh, original primary sources, which can tell a lot about uh, uh, what happened during the Second World War. And uh, what we are trying to do is most of the thing to, to give the life to the people who uh, died during the Second World War. We are not trying to deal with the numbers or the great military operations. We are trying to find people who suffered and died during the Holocaust and during the Second World War. And, and uh, as a matter of You're fact... You're focusing on personal stories. Uh, yes, we are talking say, about yeah. personal stories. Uh, we might say they were... Well, they were being forgotten because uh, when we are talking about the Second World War in the region of Yugoslavia, we are talking about great military operations. Nobody cared about the common people and, and everything else. So in the, for this year we have made a, a small exhibition called 80. Uh, we have choose 80 biographies of the common peoples. And because we are trying to commemorate 80 years of from Novi Sad raid. And this is a small step that we are trying to engage uh, a major public uh, to engage themselves in this way. So we are calling to the people to write their personal stories, to send them to us. And that is something that we are trying to do. Uh, it is interesting fact that, that during the 60s, uh, we had a, a special section in our archives uh, where the historians were called upon and to try to find personal stories. But that, uh, that program was durated only for two years. So we have a small glimpse of what they were working on it, but it's a good sense for us how we can uh, trace their work and try to, uh, to find out something from him, uh, from, from their work. So there's a lot of things to do. Uh, we must say the, uh, nobody done anything for the years. So we have a lot of, lot of things to do, a lot of things to catch up. But that's uh, uh, something that is uh, very inspiring for us. And that is what we are trying to do in our I, everyday work. I think work. that the, the sense, my sense, that is, uh, um, in Serbia, the um, many institutions that are tasked with uh, preserving records, uh, in particular uh, historical archives, uh, many of them uh, became more and more interested in this topic and approaching it in, I would say, a more contemporary professional way. Um, Still, we have quite uh, a lot of work to um, uh, do on uh, 
presenting what actually Holocaust record mean. What do, we, what do we mean by saying we are interested in Holocaust record? In particular, when uh, uh, our interest is actually focused on life, uh, life before the Holocaust, life of the communities, uh, going back however long we can go back, and also uh, coming back to life after the war. Um, very often we see this kind of misunderstanding, particularly with smaller archives, that uh, uh, they might believe that we are uh, seeking some uh, documentation of the uh, military character of uh, uh, the occupational power or whatever list of people that are being sent away, etc., which is part of the Holocaust record for sure, but without understanding really how this life used to be and that there are people behind this. The it real is stories. absolutely impossible and meaningless almost to uh, present these uh, uh, trains and numbers uh, that doesn't mean a lot. I will give you a simple uh, explanation. Uh, I'm working in historical archives of city of Novi Sad, and when I have a lot of problems, because when I, when you are a manager, you have problems on everyday account. I have gone to the one of the, our depositories where keeping collections, and I have found some box. I took it out. I watched what we are having there. It was the list of the deported Jews from Novi Sad in 1944. No, I have seen that and I said, somebody published that already, somebody researched it. And I go to my colleagues, did you he have seen this? No. Did you have seen this? No. We had that document for almost 60 years in our archives, but nobody uh, uh, acknowledged their, uh, uh, that importance of that document, uh, how many stories that gave us to us, because we know where the people lived, what they were about education, how many years that we have, and that is our primary source. But a lot of information, you can find it on a picture, you can find it in newspapers. Uh, in 1944, 1942, we, have, uh, we had in Novi Sad one uh, daily newspapers called Nova Posta, and you can see that the Jews were banned to go to the uh, bad houses where, where they could keep. So you can always say in some small of the documents or collections or newspapers traces of that everyday life and how people cope with that to survive in this horrible time. Well, that's exactly you know, this point of finding these documents that you then can sort of read between the lines or uh, against the grain in order to, to, to tease out the individual stories yes. of each of these, these, these victims. And, um, and that's, I think, uh, that's the heart of what our, the Fortune of Video Archive aimed to do from the very beginning, which was to, um, to push away from the sort of uh, anonymity of these large uh, numbers and um, you know, perpetrator lists and documents and to, um, to bring it back to each and every individual victim and to provide a face and a name and a voice, most importantly, to provide um, victims with an opportunity to, uh, to tell their story the way they, they, they wanted to. And that, I think, is um, what's so important about uh, the nature of testimony or first-person accounts. Um, we can't access the what it felt like to to be in a ghetto or a camp. Um, uh, to be deported. Uh, yes, to be deported um, uh, without these first-person accounts like the survivor testimonies in our, in our collection. And um, also to something you, you said earlier as well, uh, and, and you mentioned this, the idea of trying to figure out what happened um, prior to the Holocaust and including um, these individuals' life stories, their cultural environment, um, the things that they um, shared, uh, whether faith or culture, et cetera. Um, you can't, you cannot, it, it is impossible to, to really begin to understand what was lost unless you know the, uh, the detailed stories of these individual lives before the war and before um, the events that we, we call now call the Holocaust. So um, yet in our collection, at least, uh, our ideal methodology was um, when it was um, followed um, 
in a sort of ideal manner, would allow enough space for the survivor to really begin their story from their first memories, right? So that we, we have the entire life story from the pre-war period, the wartime period, and the post-war period. And all of these, these, these um, sections of a person's life are essential for grasping the, the sort of shattering nature of, of the Holocaust period. Exactly. I mean, these are uh, people, these are human beings. Uh, they are not defined by the date of the beginning of a war or ending of the Holocaust. That's not who they are. They are much more than that. Well, and when does, when does it begin for each country, each place, each region, each town? Um, it begins and takes shape in entirely different ways, right? And it, the event that we're, we're marking uh, tomorrow is a particularly good example of the, the complexity of, of this period, right? This is, this is an act that is undertaken not by um, German perpetrators, but by Hungarian perpetrators, right? And so where does this fit into our more, let's say, traditional narrative of how the Holocaust um, occurs, transpires over, over space and time? It's, it's again, it, it, it complicates matters and, and, and makes us rethink some of our preconceived notions. Precisely. As you might know, we have been working for almost two years now on this uh, project called the Holocaust European Values and Local History, focusing on local archives um, and um, um, trying to inspire them and to explain to them and to help them to focus on their local materials and local histories to, cre to, to create educational outreach programs based on what they have but that would not be enough I, I really want them to then contribute these uh, to the landscape of the stories and local narratives of Europe because I think that we have quite a distorted idea of the Holocaust today by a common person somewhere in Europe because I think that many of them would have this picture of a train and those, uh, you know, shoes, or, which is true. That's also part of it. But it was such a complicated event that, as you precisely said, occurred, occurred on so many different places in different times by different perpetrators uh, in different ways, even inspired by locally by different motives here and there. So. It is impossible to understand, to even to start grasping it without seeing that it is very, uh, 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 it, it is a, a sum of those local histories. And I, and I think that uh, you, you mentioned earlier that like we are just scratching on, on a surface. I think that there is a, a huge uh, a potential in, uh, in uh, researching local stories in smaller places because I think they are they are not known. I, I also notice that sometimes when we approach a smaller local archive, uh, somebody would say, yeah, we have this story, but who would be interested? Who would care? It is just some our neighbor from our small, un insignificant city when there is We don't Auschwitz. know how to tell stories. Yeah, that yeah. Is the so because Auschwitz is so big and this is so small. Well, we have to work on actually changing that idea, what, are, what is our task, and why are we even even doing this? I'll give you one simple uh, do. explanation. Uh, just across the road where we are filming now, there was once time a primary Jewish uh, private school. After the 1919, she became the, the school became public uh, state school, but the Jews from Novi Sad keep going uh, and sending their children to that school. And when I was finding a couple of persons that disappeared during the Novi Sad raid, we couldn't uh, see any kind of document to trace them where they, are, where they were, who were they. But when we took out the, the school registered and we tried to find the kids, we found everything because we have their address, who were the father or mother, where they were born, where they came from. So a lot of uh, secondary historical sources can help us to, uh, to establish the story that is, is in our folks. Sure, it's a bit of detective work. Uh, Arles and Archives, for instance, is doing fantastic work uh, currently, right now, and actually inviting people to help them investigate the documents. And I think that uh, um, this approach of, of uh, uh, 
teaching young people or in general public in general to understand the documents and how are we learning history through the sources we have is extremely important, particularly in the times when we are facing this uh, crazy distortion and falsification and, and the manipulation of, of all kinds, I mean on, on all levels from, from total lie to very dangerous, Idiots. you know, just yes. small, yes. Uh, up, you know, angles, uh, etc. So it is, it is, I think, very uh, uh, important. Well, I think an, an archive like yours with, in a town where um, you have, like, again, this organic connection to the places and the history, um, the ability to, a shared language, the ability to bring um, students into the archive and engage with these sources, these primary sources firsthand is, is uh, incredibly powerful um, in terms of you know, pedagogical, uh, pedagogical approach. Um, the United States, it's, it's a little uh, bit more difficult, uh, I think, because um, for the average, let's say, high school kid in the United States, um, how do they make that leap um, to such a foreign place and time? And sure, that's what teachers are there to do in teaching history in any period is to try to help them make that leap. But um, the complications, the challenges are, are quite large. Um, and so, you know, but one of the ways, not dis, uh, dissimilar to what you're doing with um, a connection to the, to the local, is, um, is to take the survivors who gave testimony in the community and try and make a connection uh, with, with, with high school kids or with, um, with students today, is that these, these survivors in our archive who gave their testimony, they could have been your neighbor. Right, so they could have been your butcher, your teacher. Um, they lived among you, and so um, their story becomes uh, a part of your town's local history as well. Um, it's a bit of a more difficult connection to make, I think, but um, I think that is still a really important key to connecting with 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 students today. I think that, and this is also something we are trying to do, we are trying to um, interview second generation um, survivors. And I think that particularly uh, um, interviewing second generation, in, it is my sense, uh, my impression, um, one could learn how this history was much longer than the date of celebration uh, of liberation of uh, Auschwitz, and how it impacted not only the uh, direct survivors but the generations that came. Uh, also, something that I find in many uh, uh, interviews um, that there was a silence quite often that uh, the second generation Trauma had stays to on. explore for themselves this way or the other uh, to try to understand. Uh, uh, um, uh, w what happened? I mean, of course, not always, but this is something that I noticed, uh, and I'm and I'm uh, uh, mentioning this because um, it. I feel a little bit that our entire society has been left like those of those second generation that were that feel that something happened, but we never never heard the entire story, and that we have to do this. Uh, uh, effort, a little bit of an effort of ourselves and ask and seek and trying to find out uh, if, if, if we would think of a, a, a collection such as uh, Stefan's here uh, approach um, collecting uh, personal stories today and is it part of your um, task as an archive? Uh, as an archive, no, but as a, as a researcher, yes. Uh, not, I'm not, not only the director, I'm a historian, especially a local historian. And one of my topics that I'm researching is Novi Sad raid. So I have found out in the field when I'm researching that uh, there is a lot of testimonies that should be written or should be recorded. And that is something that we should done 
and we must done in the near future because the time is ticking and it is always against us. But I can say from my first, uh, uh, from my family history, that is something that always has been spoken uh, during the family meetings and then it happened because uh, during the Yugoslavia time, uh, nobody liked to talk in public about Novi Sad raid. It was something like a forbidden memory. We must say that because it was against the policy of unity and brotherhood between uh, nations that could be uh, tearing up the socialist, idealist uh, union of the people. So it's something that uh, it was banned not to be talked. But when we gather up in you know, a family meetings, everybody was trying to uh, say, say something about their personal history. And I must say that is a trauma. My first trauma from the childhood is, uh, are these stories that happened during the Second World War. So uh, one of the primary goals and uh, uh, he, he is going to be to find out a way to record uh, as much as we can uh, testimonies that could help us as uh, researchers and historians. But I'm always saying when someone is trying to research something, uh, he will find a way and uh, he will make the, the know-how to, to, to find out the information. Um, how could we um, contribute uh, to creating better knowledge and sharing this knowledge of, of, the, of, the, of this history by connecting uh, and working together uh, between uh, archives in different countries and also institutions that could keep uh, uh, and that could have collections of different kind? Well, so the Fortuna Video Archive, uh, because we were lucky enough to find a home at Yale University, has, uh, has always been interested and focused on the, um, the sort of research potential of collections of this kind. And um, one of the things that's clear to me, having worked with researchers in this field for um, a long time, is exactly just how um, complicated it is to locate relevant materials and to um, make connections between these disparate archives that are sort of siloed off, um, whether by language or by institutional policies or um, you know, politics, what, whatever the reason might be. Um, but this is really a, a, a major challenge, um, but I think that uh, there are organizations out there uh, and initiatives um, that are, are, are working to sort of tear down some of these barriers. ERI, which is the European Holocaust Research Infrastructure um, Project, which is a, an EU-funded project, is, is working to do exactly that, to, to bring um, these archives together virtually. And I mean, here we are in, in the 21st century, we have um, this enormous, uh, these enormous capabilities technologically to not only present digital um, documents, but um, to sort of pool resources, pool metadata description of archives, bring them together and, and make it um, easier for, for teachers and researchers to, to find these archives, to use these archives, um, and to make connections between the archives. Um, the video archive has over 4,400 testimonies. Uh, and we're working with, for instance, the Arlson Archive to, to find documents about the survivors in our archive in the Arlson Archives. And there are thousands of documents in the Arlson Archive. But, um, you know, how can we, um, for the families, for the research community, bring those uh, together in a logical way to help provide a, a, a richer um, picture of, of these lives, these individual lives? And that's the challenge. And I think, I think Erie is just one example, but Erie is a, um, is, is a particularly promising um, example of, of, of a cooperative um, effort to do that. I know for a fact, uh, knowing Peter and many other colleagues here, uh, that not only that there is a huge potential here in Serbia, but there is also a huge interest by the archives in Serbia um, to share what they not only what they have but also what they learned uh, through uh, uh, researching and finding uh, in in their archival uh, uh, collections, but also they are very keen to learn um, and uh, exchange uh, um, both the materials and the knowledge. And I think that probably the most important would be to um, catch 
about the new approaches and methodologies in terms of how to understand this history and what to do with it. Uh, and in general, a little bit like a role of archive uh, has to change from a, from a very static, uh, you know, dusty room with a lot of boxes to, to uh, a, a relevant institution that is open and transparent and that coming out and showing what they have, not waiting for somebody to, to ask for things. How do you see your archive We are trying tomorrow? to transform. <laughs> we are trying to transform, as you said, until the 2014, we were that kind of institution, boring with a lot of space, a lot of boxes, uh, not open to the public. But after 2014, we have managed to uh, build a new building for historical archives uh, of Novi Sad, which became uh, one which of is the a new... beautiful, excellent building. Yeah. Thank you. Which is the, I must say, new cultural center in Novi Sad. And because of that, we have to engage with the public. And we had a chance to cooperate with the terraforming, which shows us a new ways in the archival pedagogy and, and as I said uh, in this year we are trying to make up a new graphic novel that will show us in, uh, in, in some other way what happened during the Novi Sad raid which is especially important why because in this kind of uh, saying we are trying to, co to communicate with the young, younger generations and to engage them to for them to research what happened in 1942 that, that is something new that we are trying to work on it. I would like to use this opportunity to thank you very much for your great co for the great cooperation we have with your institution also on this uh, graphic novel that you mentioned that we are trying to um, create out of the uh, resources and materials provided by the historical ar archives of the city of Novi Sad. Thank you both for this uh, very interesting conversation. I would like to uh, continue, uh, but we have other guests waiting. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Mirka.